And so it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our afternoon speaker. Now, I will not insult your intelligence by reading you her bio. You have it in your program, and I encourage everybody to open up your program and read the bio of Dr. Joya Crayer Perry. I just call her Joya. She's my friend. I'm just lucky to be able to be in a room with a person that I consider a superhero. A superhero that is ready and willing at every time to confront racism as it impacts health and outcomes. No fear at all about tackling tough issues in tough places, whether they be domestically or internationally. I will say that she's a two-time tiger, Rick Foster. But wait a minute, let me be clear. She ain't no Clemson tiger. She is a Princeton Tiger, and she's also an LSU Tiger. And both of those schools have given her an incredible amount of perspective and experience about the differences that different makes in the context of understanding how race impacts outcomes. As you can see, she's been highly awarded and given recognition from major organizations. She's spoken at the UN. She's also been honored by the Congressional Black Caucus. And we are honored today to have her here in this room to share with us for a little bit. So without any further ado, Dr. Joy Crayer Perry, MD. Give her a round of applause. I feel like I need the DJ. Okay, still a little late, I guess. Well, good afternoon, South Carolina. It's been a great day being here. I was earlier in Columbia, and I have to be full transparency. This meeting is a little feels a little different from the meeting I was in in Columbia, Rick. I don't know if you feel the same energy, but you guys have been talking about equity since I got in this room. I had to like change my slide deck. I said, I'm really here to have a conversation with some really smart people um, and to learn with you. In fact, he was, Anton was making fun of me that I was asking questions of the last panel. He said, you can't be a speaker and ask questions. I said, well, I'm learning, right? <laughs> so I like learning. So I want to take this journey with you all today where we can learn together. I right, learned a little bit more. I can share with you what I've learned in our work some of the things I get to do with Anton, and then also kind of what you're doing here and how we can grow this together. So my usual pitch that I say to people that you already know, but I'll say it, if you don't listen to anything else that I say in this few minutes, just remember this. We have health inequities, not because people are broken or they're genetically different or we make bad choices. We have health inequities because we have bad policy. We have policies that have harmed different groups of people disparately. So if you can vote, you're a policymaker. So everybody in this room is a policymaker. So we can change those policies to do something different, right? So this is the whole thrux of this work. I hope I'm going to do this right. Yes, OK, great. So our organization is about five years old. We were founded at a Healthy Start conference. Any Healthy Start folks here? No? OK, cool. Well, they all heard of Healthy Start, though, yes? yes. Yeah, OK, great. Um, so we founded a Healthy Start conference and really working on, as an OBGYN, we spend so much time clinically in offices and in spaces. And what does it look like to really work with the communities? I practiced in New Orleans, where a lot of times the same demographic of women who were my patients were also the same age group as the young men who were experiencing violence in the community, right? And so my 15 minutes of taking care of them in the office had very little impact on what they had to deal with when they left my space. And so how do we then understand that and acknowledge that our limitations as OBGYNs and what our role should be in doing community work? We recently, although I am a 48-year-old black woman living in a 48-year-old black woman's body, our original mission only was about babies. Like everybody else, we only think about babies. We forget all about women, mamas, and don't even think about the daddies. We'll leave that to you. <laughs> so we added maternal to our mission. Um, and we recently revisited our values. The value I want to lift up today is black lives. 
Because if it were not for the Black Lives Matter movement, I wouldn't have the language that I have to talk about this work. Um, it gives us a freedom to really talk about racism and white supremacy and how that impacts our health. And I'm hoping when you hear us talk about it for moms and babies, it'll make you have empathy around police violence, mass incarceration, so that when you show up for these meetings, you'll also show up for the marches around those things as well, because all those things are interrelated. So as was hope, I think was brought up, I saw one of the gentlemen earlier, this slide, that the United States is the only industrialized nation where maternal mortality is getting worse. And black women is the larger bar, three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts. In New York City, it's eight to 12 times is more likely, right? And if you see the countries below us that have better outcomes, the UK, Portugal, Germany, all those places have a much better human rights framework. One of the questions from the trivia, right? What was the thing that made life expectancy get, grow in the last 30 years? So, right, so the, when we fail, we are failing to build a structure, a social services structure. We focus so much on healthcare, like a shot is going to make racism go away. So despite spending more money on health care than any other country, right, so those same countries that have better outcomes than us are on this list and they're way down at the bottom, we still have the worst maternal mortality outcomes. So when we talk about human rights, so it was mentioned that I had the honor now of twice speaking at the UN. So I've spoken at um, my city health, city council, the state in Baton Rouge, in Congress, but really the UN was super heavy, right? Because it was me representing black women. I wasn't there to represent a governor or a mayor. I was representing black women, talking about the fact that the United United States is the only industrialized nation where maternal mortality is increasing and is significantly increasing and worsened for black women. And so the countries that have a human rights framework believe that all people have the ability to live to their full potential. Now just think about that. What would it look like for the U.S. or so the countries that have better outcomes, spend less on health care, and they have a human rights framework? So both. The United States, in the United States, both black people and women were not considered to be fully human, right, when our Constitution was written. We've been trying to get rights, civil rights, any kind of rights, right? We have an Office of Civil Rights, a Commission of Civil Rights. We've been trying to get actual just ability to vote, much less to have a full human rights. Countries who have a human rights framework do things like free college, free child care, not just maternity leave, paternity leave. Free fertility treatments, right? So not just wealthy people get to have IVF. In Amsterdam and the UK, on public insurance, three rounds of in vitro fertilization. Because the belief is all people are valuable, right? We don't have that belief system. For black people, we were two-thirds human, right? Everybody knows that white women could not get birth control in the 1960s without permission of their husbands. So you had to be married, and we didn't, you didn't, we didn't think that we had the capacity to make our own choices, right? So all of this is built in this hierarchy of human value based upon skin color, based upon gender, based upon religion, and it plays out in our policies. So who's my RJ folks? I saw the Ren folks in the house. Any other RJ folks in the house? Yay, so reproductive justice. I'm gonna give you the joy version of the history of reproductive justice. Um, if Mama Loretta were here, she would probably correct me on a few things, but she lets me keep going with this version. So back in the original um, healthcare reform, think about the Clintons, they were trying to get healthcare reform done. There was a lot of excitement around reproductive rights, access to birth control, access to co abortion. And for black women, that just didn't resonate, right? Because I currently have an eight-year-old son who I worry about when he leaves my apartment to go play in the park with a toy gun. I will never let him do that, right? Because we as black mothers have to worry about outliving our children. So our reproduction is not just based upon access to birth control or contraception. We need to have a safe and sustainable community that allows for us to thrive. So the tenets of reproductive justice are having personal bodily autonomy. How many patients say, I didn't want to get that C-section, but they made me do it anyway, or I didn't want to have, they keep bugging me about getting this IUD, I don't want one, right? So all these are choices that the systems want to place upon individuals without thinking about their own bodily autonomy, what their wishes are. How many people can come in the room for a delivery, 
We count how many people can come in the room for delivery, but we don't count how many medical students or residents we send in there. We can have all the nurses, everything, 20 of us, and you get two people, right? <laughs> so this idea of who has the value and who's supposed to be important at that moment, we don't make it about the patients or the moms. Um, the ability uh, to, have, to have children. So if I want eight kids, I want eight kids. There's nothing magical about two kids. There's nothing, you know, I have three. I feel like I'm the little old lady who lives in the shoe when they're all with me. I'm like, oh, it's a bunch of y'all. But, but you know, other people want eight, right? So how do we then say, is I can't place my value set around how many children you should have on you. I mean, if you want to parent eight children, then that is your choice, your body. And if you don't want to have children, we don't allow, I know it says in Louisiana, and I'm sure it's here too, you get Medicaid if you have pregnant. Other than that, you don't have access to insurance if you're poor. So we are totally allowing for um, only your value is only in motherhood. If you, what if you're just a woman who never wants to have kids? That means you don't get insurance? And so this idea that we, um, pregnancy essentialism is the term they use globally, that we only value women if they are pregnant or become pregnant, and that's the only time. And then that last bullet about safe and sustainable communities, that's where we get to my son, right? How, what are we doing to ensure that communities across South Carolina are safe and invested in and sustainable? Because we have had policies for hundreds of years that disinvested in communities in South Carolina. So when we created the Birth Equity Collaborative, there was no definition for birth equity, right? So like, oh, we, gotta, we have an organization, we should have a definition. So we looked at definitions for health equity, for equity in general. So this is really what resonated with us. For most people, equity tends to be a place. But we recognize we, in this current political environment, sometimes we get two steps forward and then five, six, seven, eight steps back, right? So perhaps it's not a place that we're gonna to get to. We recognize also that the people who hoard power and money today are teaching their children and grandchildren how to hoard power and money. So we have to teach our children and grandchildren how to fight for justice and equity. So that means we have to put the assurances in place for justice and equity. So that's policies, big P, and policies, little p. We have to be willing to address both racial and social inequalities, inequities, and a sustained effort. So I don't know if there are any philanthropy folks in the house, but a two-year rapid cycle grant is not gonna fix this, right? Took us 400 years to get here, it's gonna take us a minute to undo all the different layers. So people get very overwhelmed by the inequities, like it's so much. But saying it's so much without any action is not gonna get us there, right? So it's gonna take prolonged action. Y'all are some smart people. This is actually one of my new favorite slides. I have lots of favorites. This is my, one of my new favorites. Anybody in here does like healthcare or epidemiology, you do count things, right? So we always have great, we have indicators. It's like, what's the indicator for a success at your hospital? What's the indicator for success at your CPO? So for, in healthcare, for maternal and child health, our indicators are things like, um, Prenatal care, how many visits did a person get, right? Um, marital status, single parent motherhood, right? Being black, right? That's an indicator. So those are specific points that you measure, but they come from a certain framework, right? So the framework around why do we pick marital status as an indicator? What is the point? I love my husband dearly. Me being married to him has done nothing for my for maternal and child <laughs> health outcomes. It's super, super cute, right? But when two black folks who don't have wealth marry each other, the benefit of marriage is lost. So what you're counting in general for marriage is wealth transference. And when you've had a generations of people who, whose wealth has been undermined, that's just, you're just counting whether we're married or not, it doesn't matter. Um, pregnancy intention, I intend to run a marathon. That requires me actually to exercise one day and actually jog, right? <laughs> So under what framework would we decide that things like pregnancy intention, marital status, were indicators that were appropriate for us to get to our, our, our goal? What is our goal? So for me, when we look at human rights, that's a framework. Reproductive justice is a framework. Birth equity is a framework. So what are the measurements, what are the indicators that we would use to get to those things, right? 
I would say that the framework that these current indicators were built under, what most of America was built under, was a framework of white supremacy, a framework of a belief that you needed a husband and a wife and two kids and a dog, and you only took care of each other, and that's going to get us to having great health outcomes. None of us, that doesn't work. Right? So you have to have wealth built in that, you have to have power built into that. So if we really want to have a framework of birth equity, we would look at things instead of pregnancy intention. What about pregnancy well-being? How do we measure what people would need to be well when they're pregnant? You would need things like social services. You would need mental health care services. You would need adequate transportation in urban or rural environments. So we wouldn't just blame people on their choices. We would create a culture of wellness for pregnancy. And there's no indicator we currently have for that, because that's not been the framework under which we've been measuring. So you in South Carolina could develop new measurements, new frameworks, under whatever, if your framework is equity, which I heard y'all talk about all afternoon, then what should you be measuring to get to equity? And are the current things that you're measuring actually getting you to the outcome of equity? I would argue no. All right, so we don't have to do these. These are common language. I heard like five people talk about these, so y'all already know these already. Um, but I do want, this slide is really talking about the social determinants which I heard y'all talking about, which is exciting. In 2005, I was the director of maternal and child health for the city of New Orleans. It's a great thing. I was young. It was an exciting time to be at the city. And you know, exciting things were happening. The president flew over the city. Remember, he waved at us, right? Um, and the World Health Organization actually came to the city. Um, and they sat down in a room like this. And I, as a young person at the health department, got to take notes while they were talking about this amazing idea of social determinants of health, that it's not just your genes or your choices that cause disparate outcomes, right? That you don't have childhood obesity in communities just because kids like chiwis, right? You have it because we, have no, we don't have access to availability of food, lack of places for exercise, right? And so that causes unhealthy behaviors which lead to a disparity in illness and disease. Now, but see, the top of my slide is empty. Because what we haven't had an honest conversation about in this country and around across the globe, because you know, I, I travel a lot, is that how do we get to these social determinants? We act as if I've always lived in black communities because I just like black people and I show up and see some and I buy a house, right? So like, what caused the social determinants of health inequities in the first place? And it's a power and wealth imbalance. And those are things like our labor markets, our housing policy, our tax policy. I'm sure you guys have different tax policies around schools. We could have a whole, we don't have a right to education in this country. It's a local right. And that has a history in racism and after reconstruction, right? So we base our tax base at our schools on local investments and we know that black home ownerships are, black homes, people who live in homes that are black, their houses are devalued for about by 28%. So we're already starting for the same house, no crime being devalued and that's funding our schools schools, which then have no money for the schools, and then we blame the kids because they're getting a poor education. So that is a power and wealth imbalance. In New Orleans, where I'm from, after Hurricane Katrina, um, they tore down a lot of the housing and built fancy condos, and the people who were the construction folks got tax credits, right? As long as they had about 7% of the people who moved into the homes were low income, they would get a tax credit. So they made a lot of money, they built these buildings, but you only had to have them in there for 10 years. So what do you think happened in 2015? All the poor people got kicked out of all those fancy buildings, right? So that's a choice, that's a political choice that decreases people's housing, decreases access for housing for people who are poor, low income. And then we go, oh, that's just how it is. It doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be. Nobody in this room would say that's fair, right? That you get to make money, get a tax break, and kick the poor people out? Like, what, why would that be the thing we would come up with? I would never go, first of all, you only have to do 7%. Let's just start there. That's like nobody. It's like, you, you have five people in your building. Um, so anyway, so this power and wealth balance has three main root causes, which are racism, classism, and gender oppression. Right, so until we really have honest conversations around those three root causes, you can add some more. You could add religious fundamentalism. That's big in my state. You could add casteism. You could add tribalism, right? But if you don't work on those root causes, you're gonna just keep making programs for social determinants. So we're gonna now have WIC vouchers turn into lift vouchers so people can have transportation without actually fixing our transportation infrastructure in this country. 
rural and urban, it's awful. We have a horrible transportation infrastructure. So this idea of really working on those root causes is so important, and I know that's the work that you all are doing, moving away from just talking about the social determinants, but how did they come to be? How did that exist here in South Carolina? Race is real, but not in the way racist people think it is. I am black, I love being black, love some hip hop, I can make anything into a hip hop conversation, gonna die black, but it's not my genetics, right? So race does not equal an ethnic group, does not equal a population, does not equal ancestry, right? So we conflate all of those things and we make measures and decisions based upon a social and political construct, a belief in a hierarchy of human value based upon skin color. We even do story, uh, in, in OBGYN, we'll do a study that says, black women's vaginal flora causes preterm birth. Like bacteria can see my melanin and then like come to my vagina and say this is where I want to be. Like this is, this is the kind of studies that we pay millions of dollars to researchers to do that make no biological sense and we still do them today, today, right? So we have to really think about why do we keep going down this path of white supremacy? So the different levels of racism and this is where I want my fancy video guy to help me Play, uh, to do the video, we'll do just a short video and then we'll come back and have a conversation. Is that okay? Okay. He's gonna, so while he's putting it up, so How did the idea oh, of race begin in America? The answer can be found in the long and complex history of Western Europe and the United States. It is that history, influenced by science, government, and culture, that has shaped our ideas about race. When European colonists first arrived on North American shores beginning in the 1500s, the land was already inhabited by Native Americans. The Spanish, French, and English encountered frequent conflicts with indigenous peoples while trying to establish settlements in Florida, the Northeast area bordering Canada, the Virginia colony, and the Southwest. By the 1600s, English colonists had established a system of indentured servitude that included both Europeans and Africans. But by the time of Bacon's rebellion in the mid-1670s, an insurrection involving white and black servants against wealthy Virginia planters, the status of Africans had begun to change. They were no longer servants who had an opportunity for freedom following servitude, but instead were relegated to a life of permanent slavery in the colonies. In the 1770s, English colonists in the U.S. became involved in a rebellion of their own. This time, the opposition was the British Crown. But while the colonists battled the British for independence, they continued to deny Africans their freedom and withhold rights to Native Americans. Ironically, one of the first casualties of the Revolutionary War was Crispus Attucks, a runaway slave of African and Indian parentage. Before the idea of race emerged in the U.S., European scientist Carolus Linnaeus published a classification system in Systema Naturae in 1758 that was applied to humans. Thomas Jefferson was among those who married the idea of race with a biological and social hierarchy. Jefferson, a Virginia slave owner who helped draft the Declaration of Independence and later became president, was influential in promoting the idea of race that recognized whites as superior and Africans as inferior. Jefferson wrote in 1776 in Notes on the State of Virginia, quote, Blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind." Unquote. Scientists were among those who were influenced by these ideas and began to develop their own theories about race. In the 18th and 19th centuries, scientists influenced by Enlightenment philosophers developed a system of categorizing things in nature, including humans. Although Carolus Linnaeus was the first to develop a biological classification system, it was German scientist Johann Blumenbach who first introduced a race-based classification of humans, which established a framework for analyzing race and racial differences for the next hundred years. By the 19th century, the debate over race centered around two theories. One theory was that different races represented different species. The other was that humans were one species and that race represented variation in the human species, a view that was compatible with the teachings of the Bible. Among those who espoused the multiple species theory, or polygyny, were Philadelphia physician Samuel Morton and European scholar Louis Agassiz. Their work was popular in the mid-19th century. The most prominent scientist who believed in monogyny, that all humans were one species, was Charles Darwin. 
By the mid-19th century, scientific debates over race had entered the mainstream culture and served to justify slavery and mistreatment. Some, like plantation doctor Samuel Cartwright, tried to explain the tendency of slaves to run away by coining the term drapetomania and prescribed whipping as a method of treatment. Though there was resistance to slavery in both the U.S. and Europe, scientists, for the most part, continued to advance theories of racial inferiority. The abolitionist movement of the 19th century sought to humanize the plight of African slaves in various ways to influence political power and public opinion. The resistance to slavery and the image of Africans as subhuman can be found in protest hymns like Amazing Grace, which was written by John Newton in 1772 in response to the horrors he witnessed working on an English slave ship. One of the ways that race played out in popular culture was in the publication in 1852 of the most widely read novel of its time, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which depicted a more realistic portrait of slavery and tried to humanize slaves. The 19th century also marked a period of widespread racialization, not just of African Americans, but of Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and Chinese Americans as well. Much of the racializing of non-Europeans and even the Irish served an economic and political purpose. African slavery, for instance, provided free labor and added political clout for slaveholding states in the South. Taking Native American land and belittling Native American cultures was made easier by defining Native people as savages. At the end of the 19th century, the U.S. experienced another wave of European immigration. This time, the immigrants were Southern and Eastern Europeans, and their presence challenged ideas about race. Specifically, who was white and who was not. Unlike earlier European immigrants who were mostly German, Scandinavian, and Irish, these newer immigrants were Polish, Italian, and Jewish and brought with them customs and traditions that were different from their European predecessors. They were often the victims of discrimination. Even U.S. immigration policy tried to limit the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe by imposing quotas. At the beginning of the 20th century, African Americans migrated north for factory jobs that opened up during World War I and to escape the violence in the South. Between 1889 and the early 1920s, roughly 50 to 100 lynchings a year took place in the U.S. While blacks were mostly the victims, Italian Americans, Asian Americans, and Jews were also lynched. Even in the North, blacks encountered racism as they competed with whites for jobs. Several northern cities, St. Louis, Tulsa, Detroit, and Chicago, among others, were the sites of major race riots from 1915 to the early 1920s. During the Depression, some race scientists sought to justify economic and social inequality by attributing certain characteristics, such as criminal behavior, work ethic, and intelligence to race, using a theory of genetic inheritance. In other words, you were poor or a criminal or less intelligent because it was in your genes. This idea was the basis for eugenics. Charles Davenport, the director of the eugenics records office, was among the scientists who promoted these ideas. The eugenicist expert testimony was influential in getting Congress to pass the Immigration Act of 1924 and provided the social framework embraced by Nazi Germany. By World War II, the U.S. had expanded the racial categories in the census to include various ethnic groups, among them Mexicans, Japanese, Indians from Asia, and Filipinos. These categories and the demographics associated with each group would be used to limit immigration as well as provide the statistical data to analyze racial discrimination in the U.S. that followed in the post-war era. The 1950s and 60s were a time of enormous social change in the U.S. Discrimination and institutional racism were being challenged at every turn. To some extent, the racial and social hierarchies that had long been accepted were being contested. And perhaps more slowly, attitudes about race and racial difference were beginning to change. The way we view race and ethnicity today is far more complex than the simple categories in the first U.S. Census. In fact, in the 2000 Census, the Mark One or More option allowed for 63 possible racial combinations, reflecting the diversity of the country. By the year 2010, the U.S. population will barely resemble what it was 400... Part of the reason I have him turn it off is because then you see how old this video is, right? By the year 2010, we're almost uh, to 2020. But the reason that I love showing it is that it shows you how science was so influenced by racism. How many of you knew all of that that was in the video? Yeah. So a lot of us learned it, not because we learned it in school, 
but our, a lot of black folks know it because we learned it inside of black communities, inside of our homes, inside of black social organizations. Usually when I do these talks, this is news to white people, right? This is not something that people have heard about. They didn't know that there was this whole theory around embedding um, a hierarchy of human value inside of science, that people were working on making a disease out of wanting to be free. Right? It sounds crazy now, but think about all the things that we now make into diseases and, and where that comes from. When we blame patients for not being compliant, what does that word mean really? Have we looked into why they're not able to attend their, their appointments? So we have this history of blaming patients and looking for excuses as to what their problem is without looking at our structures. Does anybody have any thoughts before I move on about the video? No? Yeah, I got quiet. Okay, so let's talk about whiteness then, since we're here, right? So we have books that are written about black health centers, NIH centers, all kind of stuff. We never talk about whiteness, as if the default from blackness is air. But just like being black is a social and political construct, so is being white. So this idea of, as you saw in the video, as people came, like Jewish people became white, they weren't at first, Irish people became white, right? So the political power of being a part of a group that has more wealth and more status was really important for folks, right? Um, so, in fact, Catholic folks, you know, that's a whole, the first Catholic president, like all that, but this is all big to do to get into being white and Protestant um, was important. So the impact of that on your health really exists. So Dr. David Williams is the third author on this paper, but in my mind, He's because it, he's fancy and he's at Harvard and I believe we're friends. Um, I always bring him up. I met him a few times. Um, but he, he and his colleagues created this framework around whiteness and health. And he talks about the positive consequences of, this, um, of the belief around being white. And one of them is this belief of a meritocracy, right? Like, if you just work really hard, you will make it, go out to the West, young man, life will be great, right? So there's a belief in whiteness. Um, and that belief is held up by economic and social structures. So it's easy to believe it, because look at Congress, right? Turns out that happens really well. But here are some negative consequences. Um, 57 to 62% of white Americans believe that life has changed for the worse since the 1950s. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find some folks of color who would agree. Um, and 50 to 60% believe that discrimination against whites is as big of a problem as discrimination against blacks. So when I was in medical school, I was taught that white men are 12 times more likely to commit suicide than black women. Right? And so the, we weren't looking for the gene for suicide in white men. We would say things like, where they're so stressed, they have to be head of household, they have to, all these pressures around leading the entire world, right? Um, but there's also, I did a panel up with this, um, with a sister who's Latina and a native sister around this, and in communities of color, we have a redemptive narrative. We recognize times always get hard. People always lose, but we gonna be all right, right? We got songs, we have belief. Where is the redemptive narrative for white men? When do they get to fail? The problem with white supremacy is it says you don't get to fail. So what happens when you do actually fail, because life doesn't work like that, then there's no redemptive narrative, right? So the idea of white supremacy is also harming white men. So it's important for us to point that out, right? So it's not, we're not just doing this for our own sakes, for all of our sakes. It's important that we undo this belief in a hierarchy of human value. So I do, I used to get hired to t talk about implicit bias and I talk about all this other stuff. So I just have some slides on bias. As I told Rick earlier, my bias, I took this, anybody taking the implicit association test? Great. Yes, so you should all take it online, it's free. Just look up implicit association. I'm biased against old white dudes. I know y'all are shocked. I've been working on it. It's the thing. We had a whole couple of hours in the car, so we're bonded. He's helping me with my bias. I'm leaning in. <laughs> I'm working on it. So you should spend some time with the groups under which you find out that you're biased. Exactly. I'm going to quote you like David Williams, kind of. So then, um, my favorite book is Ibram Kendi's Stamp from the Beginning, The History of Racist Ideas in America. And people ask him, what came first? He's now written, he's won the American Book Award, and now he's on book number two, How to Be an Anti-Racist. But people ask him, what came first, racist ideas or racist policies? And he would say, people use racist ideas for, for, power, for power. So politicians use it to get more political power. 
Um, capitalists use it to get more money. So we have collective power. Once we recognize people are using these ideas so they can hold and hoard power, what are we doing as a collective? How are we in South Carolina going to say we're not going to allow racist ideology to harm all of us? We're going to come together and say that this is wrong. We are not going to underfund Medicaid because it's just for poor black people. We know that it, it's important for all of us to live to ensure that we have funded Medicaid adequately. Right? That's just an example of how we choose to make things into a racial, racialized institutions. Um, and then this is just you know showing Dr. Cartwright, um, who they mentioned in the film, who created Drapedomania at my institution, Tulane. I did residency, but also Marion Sims, who's a South Carolina guy, right? Y'all got some statues up around him who traveled around the world, around the country, with three black women who were enslaved, Lucy, Betsy, and Anarka. And he did surgeries on them without anesthesia. Um, the Atlantic slave trade had ended, but we still had slavery. So black women's uteruses were literally the engine, economic engine of this country. So we created obstetrics and gynecology as a field so we could make sure that people could, that black women could have more slaves, more babies ensure that we had um, ability to fund this country, right? So it's important that we know that as OBGYN. We don't learn that in residency, but we need to know our history and we need to know how we were created. Um, family planning, I'm sure there's some family planning folks in the house. And um, for me, knowing that it was created by Nixon should scare the crap out of all of you. <laughs> right? So it was his anti-poverty strategy, right? He believed that if he could put family planning clinics in black and brown communities, that we would all be wealthy. Turns out that didn't work. Didn't work across the globe either. Um, it's important to know that um, our uteruses are not the way to, out of poverty. There are plenty of poor people who don't have any children. Um, and this strategy around reproduction as a way to ensure that we have wealth. You know who makes, who, does, who has fewer children? Wealthy people. So if you invested in making people wealthy, they would have fewer children. Trying to have people to make middle class choices without middle class money is insanity. And then um, really talking about how we currently look at the opioid epidemic versus when I was a resident, the crack epidemic, right? We put people in jail, we took their kids. If we had treated the um, crack epidemic the same way that we're currently treating the opioid epidemic, we wouldn't be here today, right? We would have created systems that were kind around substance abuse. So that's not to say we shouldn't be kind today, but we can't keep racializing things and pretending that people are um, disposable, and then it comes back to bite us in the butt. 20 years later, because we didn't do what we were supposed to do during the crack epidemic in the first place. Um, and then some solutions. So I'm a part of a um, documentary titled Death by Delivery. We usually have screenings like this, and afterwards we have a conversation, and it talks about racism as a root cause for black maternal health. Um, so it's a conversation starter for folks to have. You could also do some advocacy. Um, the idea that nonprofits can't do advocacy is a lie. Every time somebody tells you that, say that's not what the law says. You can do advocacy. You can do. You can go to the Capitol. You can explain to them that racism is real. That's not violating any kind of uh, exposure. So really, your organizations have a strong role in educating your legislature around these issues. This is what we did with some funding through the Kellogg Foundation. It's called the Campaign for Black Babies. We interviewed black women who'd had an infant death, and we looked at um, their stories. Almost all of them talked about transportation, and that's why I bring up transportation, because we don't deal with transportation in this country. And that's not just to a doctor's visit, right? They didn't have transportation to wash their clothes. If you have a newborn, and you're trying to figure out how to wash your clothes, how does that happen, right? Where is it, where, what are we doing about those kind of stressors? Um, we went through um, Z codes. I don't know if there are any providers in the house, but th when you do your coding, there are codes there on the social determinants of health, so it's important for us to use those as a solution because public health can use that information when it comes to um, homelessness, uh, lack of food insecurity, and most providers call these throwaway codes. And the more that we throw them away, the more we're also throwing away our community members, because we need this information in order to build better infrastructure for our hospital systems and our communities. We wrote a black paper, not a white paper. Oh, how did that do? Right? <laughs> on holistic care for our black moms. Right? It centers the mom. Um, it's on the Black Mamas Matter Alliance website. It's important for us to think about how do we find and uplift black community. 
Um, we are now part of the first federal Black Maternal Health Caucus, which is Congresswoman Alma Adams and um, Congresswoman Underwood are the co-leads of the caucus. Last year, because it's getting a lot of media attention, about 20 bills were put forth through the federal legislation for maternal mortality. Our hope is that we can make sure that we have a racial equity lens for all those bills. Are they disaggregating the data? Are they ensuring that they are looking to, to make sure the people who are the most impacted are a part of those solutions? We, at the kickoff, that's where I was earlier with Rick for the AIM work group. I know a lot of you might be doing that work around including um, uh, bundles, safety bundles. Our job next is to make sure we have a racial equity lens in that work. And then this is what we're funded to do right now through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Probably the most transformative thing about this project is that we're the PI. So the small nonprofit is the PI. My subcontractors are Stanford University and the American College of OBGYN. Let me just say that power dynamic in and of itself is a whole, you could write books about how, how, that, how painful it can be for me at times. But um, it's, it's important for us to start investing in the actual grassroots organizations on the ground. You, if you keep giving money to the big academic institutions and then saying, here, give $10,000 to this grassroots organization, you're never going to get the solutions that you need for equity. So you have to redefine how you think of capacity. And if they don't have actual capacity in the community, they're going to not be able to get you to equity. And then this is my last slide. So in Ibram's book, he separates people as either segregationist, assimilationist, or anti-racist, right? Um, and he tells a story of people like Angela Davis, but he also tells a great story for a chapter around um, Abraham Lincoln. Right? Love Abraham Lincoln. He freed the slaves. Yes, yay, President Lincoln. I needed him to be here, right? But he was also a complicated person. So near the end of his presidency, he brought in the top five black people to the White House. Um, Anton and I know that that White House can be a tricky place. So he brought in the top five people to the black people. We can picture it. They're going up. And then he says to them, look, guys, I've got $3 million. Liberia says you can come back. Why don't you just take your people and go back to Africa? So the black folks are like, um, you know, because we've been here for 250 years, working for free, building all this, we would like some benefit from the stuff we had built for y'all for free. And he said to them, but guys, you're being so selfish. If you would just leave, the war would end. Because the truth is, although Abraham Lincoln was a good and moral man, he believed black people were broken. And we had served our purpose. We had come to the US to build it by, if doing that had broken us, like Thomas Jefferson said, or if we just already came here broken, it didn't really matter. But we were broken, and we needed to go back. So he was a typical um, segregationist, right, that we should be separate. So if you're in this room and you're doing this work around equity and you believe that black people are broken and your job is to come save us, then you, we don't need you in this work. We need you to understand, <laughs> thank you. Right? We need you to understand that we are all equal and that the policies and, and the procedures that are harming us that we can undo, um, and that we want you to be actively anti-racist, to believe that we're in this together, we're fighting together to ensure that everybody has equal opportunity to thrive. And that is it. So, thank you all. Thank you.